kind of wanted to review a little bit, and I got these great slides from, uh, uh, from Tim LaHaye and Thomas Ice, who put out a, a book called Charting the End Times, and then put it all on PowerPoint slides, as well as in the book. And, um, and we'll kind of go to the slides, and we'll try to walk through what we've covered already in, in the book of Daniel. A timeline that takes us from uh, 612 BC, the beginning of the Babylonian Empire. So uh, uh, we know from that point in time over Israel, basically, even though they ruled a little bit in, in, in small periods of time, but Gentiles ruled over Israel from that time, and that will continue until the time uh, of, uh, of Jesus coming back. So there's the, the cross in the timeline, uh, and then at the end, you've got... Uh, you can go ahead, Kathy. The next one, you've got Israel. Go ahead again. And, and then you've got that end of the timeline of uh, the return of Christ to, to planet Earth to set up his kingdom. And in uh, the top of that, he touches the Mount of Olives. At the bottom of the timeline, 612 B.C., again, the Babylonian Empire, the head of gold, Daniel 2. And then we get to the Medo-Persian Empire, the, the chest of silver. And then the Greek Empire was the, uh, the, the bronze. And then to the Roman Empire, iron that was split in two, signified by the two legs, western uh, and uh, eastern. And then the revived Roman Empire that is yet future, uh, uh, signified there in Daniel in that vision uh, by the feet that were a mixture of iron and, uh, and clay and so forth. So that's Daniel chapter 2. And then we've got to Daniel chapter 7. Uh, again, we came back to uh, uh, another vision. Got a, oh, th that ended, of course, with uh, the stone without hands. The significance of God would destroy that, uh, that last world empire and set up his millennial kingdom. There it is, the stone that sets up the millennial kingdom. And then I think we make it to, uh, there's Daniel. So now we're in Daniel 7. We're there a couple of weeks ago. That first uh, uh, vision had four beasts in it. And see the, the lion with the wings, again, representing the Babylonian Empire. The bear representing the Medo-Persian. Uh, the leopard with the four wings representing the Greek Empire that splits into four divisions. And then that last beast that was contrasted and completely different that rarely represented this last world in, uh, empire that had ten horns that represented ten kings. Three of them end up being uprooted. One of them takes over all of them, and he is the Antichrist that will rule in the last revived Roman Empire. In this chapter, we get to uh, a vision of a ram and a vision of a goat that represent, and not speculation, uh, Gabriel will tell us that they represent, again, the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greek Empire. So that's kind of the uh, at least a, a timeline of how all these things kind of uh, fit together. As we get into uh, Daniel 8 here, again, lots more details. And it's going to sound like Ancient History 101. But you keep in mind that Daniel is writing this hundreds of years before these events ever, uh, ever take place. And one of the things that at least uh, minimally we want to get out of this is to realize that uh, as um, our friend uh, Pastor Waxer says, God is enlarged and in charge. Uh, he is, that means he is sovereign uh, over, uh, over everything and the affairs of man and, and those that rule in terms of world empires. It also helps us appreciate the fact that God's word, the Bible, is inspired because we've got Daniel in exacting details now giving us information about world empires that would come after him, uh, and he's given us this information hundreds of years in advance. Uh, I think it'll be interesting. The details of the first two kingdoms are given here in verses 1 to 8. And the third year of the reign of Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision. After the one that had already appeared to me in my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa, in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal, Ulaibra. 
that's, you can always remember the name of that canal. I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns, standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as he charged towards the west, and the north, and the south. No animal could stand against him. None could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. He came towards the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at him in great rage. I saw him attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering his two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him. The goat knocked him to the ground and trampled on him, and none could rescue the ram from his power. The goat became very great, but at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off. And in its place were four prominent horns grew up towards the four winds of heaven. Uh, again, we'll stop there, but uh, uh, what Daniel's talking about, of course, is, and we know from uh, later in the text is, uh, and from our timeline there, he's seen a vision. There's a vision of a, of, of a ram uh, that's got two horns representing the Medo-Persian uh, empire. Uh, it's powerful and so forth, and he gives us some details uh, about it. Uh, first thing we see from Daniel uh, in terms of the details of the ram is that he saw the details of a future city. In verse 1 it says, In the third reign of Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision. And then he goes on and says, I was, I was in the citadel of, of Susa. Now what's interesting is that it doesn't exist at this time, and it's 130 miles from where Daniel was. Daniel is taken in the future and taken to the citadel of Susa by the, what kind of canal? Ulibra Canal. So he's, he's there for that. What's interesting about that is that uh, this would be, the, in a sense, the capital uh, later of, of the Medo-Persian Empire of Persia. Uh, this is the place where uh, a woman named Esther would receive her crown and stand before the king. This is the place where a cupbearer named Nehemiah would one day go before Xerxes and intercede on behalf of the people and so forth. This is where Daniel is. This is what he's seeing. It doesn't exist yet. He's not in that geographic location, but it's the place God has taken him to in the future to give him uh, this vision. And of course, in the vision, then uh, uh, details of, uh, of the identity of the ram are given. Uh, Daniel saw a ram with two, two long horns. They didn't rise simultaneously. One was longer than the other. The shorter one outgrows the other one eventually. Uh, and again, significant of the Medo-Persian Empire. The Medes come on the scene with the Persians, and they're kind of the stronger, the longer horn. Uh, but eventually, the Persian king, kingdom overpowers the Medes. In fact, uh, later we would refer to it as the Persian Empire, no longer the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, and so again, everything that Daniel's saying, these things about this future kingdom uh, come to pass. Uh, the third detail is the way the ram is conquered. Uh, he says, I watched the ram as he uh, charged towards the, uh, the west uh, and the north and the south. And uh, uh, that's exactly how the Medo-Persian Empire did it. Uh, they went west, uh, again, towards the Mediterranean. Then they conquered to the north. And then they conquered to the south to establish their world empire at, at that time. If Daniel had said, they went to the south first, or, the, or they went to the north first, he would be completely wrong. We would consider him a false prophet, but again, all of his details happened exactly the way he said that they would. Uh, the fourth detail is that the symbolism associated with the kingdom. Uh, when the uh, king of Persia went into battle, uh, like most kings, or unlike most king, he wasn't wearing any kind of a diadem or crown or anything. He wore the head of a ram on his head. Uh, the ram was, again, associated with his kingdom. That's what was minted uh, on their coins. Uh, not only that, uh, uh, it's from uh, this kingdom, the Persian kingdom, that we get the religion or, uh, of Zoroasterism. Who, those are the guys that developed the, the zodiac and, the, and the, all the, the 12 signs and the charting of the stars and, and all of that. And it's interesting because, again, uh, the kingdom of Persia, uh, they, they were under the zodiac sign as well, and they were Ares, which is the ram. Uh, uh, we'll look at Greece in a, in a moment. They were Capricorn and they were the goat. So even in the symbolism associated with these nations later, 
Daniel, through God inspiring him, is able to see exactly uh, as they turned out to be. Secondly, Daniel sees the, the details of a kingdom pictured as a goat, the, the Greek empire or Hellenistic empire. And the first detail is that there's a notable horn. Uh, and uh, that, uh, again, this notable horn is the one that's going about in, in great rage and, and conquering the Medo-Persian Empire. And, and it's very easy to identify him as, as Alexander the Great. And, uh, and again, even the symbols on the Greek coins actually uh, had a goat. Um, again, uh, the details here is the way he conquered as well. Notice the, ga- the goat came, or Alexander uh, came from the west. Uh, he didn't come from the east or the south. He came exactly the way Daniel said that he would. Verse 5 said he came crossing uh, the whole earth. If you know anything about Alexander the Great, um, uh, he starts out and uh, every time he attacks and conquers a, a nation, a people group, a large city, whatever it was, he would say to them that survive, is there anyone that lives that way? Is there any way that lives that way? And if there was, he would go and conquer them. And then after he conquered them, he'd say, is there anybody else that lives <laughs> to the north or to the east that they haven't been? And if there wasn't, then they moved on. If there was, they went and conquered them. Alexander the Great in, in his time conquered, again, he's, this is the Greek empire. They move all the way through the Middle East, Iraq, Iran, all the way across, you know, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, that whole area they've conquered. Uh, they make their way into India. They conquer all the way through India. And a lot of historians believe they made it all the way into parts of China. Uh, when, when Daniel said there would be a notable horn, one guy that would rule this particular kingdom and he would smash the Medo-Persian empire and he would conquer the known world. As far as Alexander knew, he, he did it all, which is one of the reasons he went into such a depression a, a, after a while. He was a great uh, military leader. He's the guy that developed what's called uh, the wedge. The wedge was uh, used by uh, the, the Romans, and you see a little bit of it in the movie uh, Gladiator at the beginning. The idea of lining guys up front with their shields, either one or two deep, and actually setting them in a V trying to attack their, uh, their adversary either at sunrise or at sunset when the sun was low. Those shields were highly polished. They would turn them away from the sun and march right into battle. And just before they engaged the enemy, all the guys in the front row would turn their shields to the sun. It would blind everybody in the front row, and then they would just smash ahead. In the V like this, guess where Alexander was? Right at the head of the V. He wasn't your typical king. This guy was uh, a military genius, but uh, he was a warrior. He wanted to be the head of the the arrow. He wanted to be right into the fight, which you could imagine uh, brought along a a lot of respect from those that that fought with him. Verse 5 says that the goat or Alexander was not touching the ground. It's just a, a Hebrew figure or speech that talks about the swiftness with which he would conquer. Again, Daniel's not looking back in history, writing a book <laughs> about Alexander. He's predicting how he would live out his life and, and rule this kingdom. Uh, Alexander conquered 120 provinces of the Medo-Persian Empire in, in less than three years. And remember, the, we talked a little bit about the Medo-Persian Empire. These guys had a million-man army. That, that's, that's a lot to date. That's not the whole army. That was, they had a million foot soldiers. Uh, and that was their thing. I mean, when they would go into battle, they just outnumbered the other guys and just smashed them. It wasn't brilliant military tactics. It was just brute force. And Alexander uh, uh, takes over the entire Medo-Persian Empire uh, in, in really less than three years, as Daniel said that he would. Verse 6, Daniel says, I saw him attack the ram, the Medo-Persian Empire, with furiously or in great rage, striking the ram and shattering his two horns. And uh, uh, that was typical of his, uh, of his army. They're, they're, they were so brutal that uh, sometimes they would come across a, a, a fortress and everybody uh, in that fortress would come outside the city wall and lay on the ground with their weapons and beg for mercy rather than even fight them because they were, they were, so, uh, they were so brutal. Uh, he was, uh, this talks about the fact that he was enraged uh, against the, the Medo-Persian Empire. And the reason is because of two battles, <laughs> the Battle of, uh, of Marathon, uh, which was in 490 BC, and the Battle of Salamis, which is in 481. Greek cities near Athens. And uh, the Greeks were a little ticked off still because the Persians drove that far west and destroyed both of those cities. 
And so now when Alexander goes back, and he goes after the Medo-Persians, he goes back with a little bit of an attitude. And that's exactly what uh, Daniel said would happen. Notice in verse 8, it says, The goat became great. Uh, at the age of 21, he dies at 32, at the age of 21, uh, he is considered to be the world's most powerful and brilliant military genius. Uh, that's not my opinion. That's the opinion at that time uh, through uh, secular writing that we have and so forth. Uh, and again, he's the guy that stood at the peak of the V when they went into, went into battle. Verse 8, though, says, uh, but at the height of his power, the large horn, Alexander, would be, would be broken. And he was. He dies in 323 B.C. at the age of 32, uh, basically as a drunk and in depression because there was no other worlds, no other peoples to conquer. I mean, there was a point in time where I mean, they're pretty much into China and his four generals are going, we're done. <laughs> you know, this, this is enough. This is enough. Uh, and he basically uh, dies as a broken man just the way that Daniel describes this great horn conquers so quickly, so fiercely, but uh, he's broken uh, in the end. And then Daniel gives us the detail that his kingdom is, is divided. And, uh, and we know again, uh, Daniel says it'll be divided in four. And that's what happened to Alexander's kingdom. His four generals uh, took over that huge kingdom that uh, they had conquered. And they didn't exactly do junk in a pot to see who got what. I mean, it was ba they didn't like draw a map and you get this and you take that. Oh, no, no, you have a little more of this. And I'll have, they, basically, they, they secured areas and said, if you come any further, I'll kill you. You know, I mean, they, they kind of fought it out and, 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 and uh, developed their own, their own lines of who would rule what. Uh, Cassander o overtook and ruled Macedonia and Greece. Uh, Lysimachus took over Asia Minor, uh, Seleucus took over Syria uh, and Babylon, Ta and the Ptolemy took over Egypt and Israel uh, in the island of, uh, of Cyprus. And then what ensues in, uh, in history after that, in particular to Israel, because you've got Ptolemy uh, running the show there in Egypt and Israel, and then up in Greece, you've got the Seleucid Empire, and these guys kind of fight it out for, with each other. And Daniel actually, again, predicts that gives lots of details of that uh, in chapter 11. But details of two kingdoms are given, and then one king will dominate in power. That's in verse 9 to 14. Out of one of them came another horn. So out of one of the generals, out of one of these kingdoms comes another horn, another kingdom, another leader, which started small, but grew in power to the south and to the east and to the beautiful land. That's uh, the windward side of Oahu, of course. Or it could be Israel. I mean, it's one of the two. I'm not really sure. It grew until it reached the host of heavens and threw some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the prince of the host. It took away the daily sacrifice from him and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. Because of rebellion, the host of the saints and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It's it, but it's a person. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long would it take for the vision to be fulfilled, the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, and the surrender of the sanctuary and of the host that will be trampled underfoot? He said to me, It will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be re <coughs> reconsecrated. So we've got another leader that comes on the scene, a king. Again, you've got Alexander the Great. His whole kingdom gets divided into fours. And out of one of them is going to rise this other king that's very powerful. And he persecutes uh, the people of God there uh, in, in Israel. A couple of things about him. It says that, again, insignificant beginning, later he, he dominates. Uh, two, uh, the king dominates in particular the people of Israel, again, verse 9, he exerts his power southward and eastward and toward the beautiful land. Again, uh, that is Israel. Verse 10, he grew until uh, it, uh, it grew or he grew, his power grew until it reached the host of heavens 
and threw some of the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. And sometimes you could read in that, ooh, starry host, you know, who's that? Well, that's the people of God. Daniel 12 refers to, uh, again, the Jews, the children of Israel, as, as uh, the stars that shine like the universe. And there's other references in the Old Testament likening that. So this is somebody that comes along and really persecutes the, uh, the Jewish people. Uh, verse 11, he uh, sets himself up as Israel's king, calling himself the prince of hosts. And then he prohibits Israel from following her religious practices, removing the daily sacrifices and so forth. And then verse 12, he prospered and he so despised the truth, that would be God's word, that he throws it uh, to the ground. Uh, these are all things that's going to happen through this, this ruler. And then the king that dominates can be seen, we would say, in, in Antiochus Epiphanes. So that's exactly what happened. What Daniel said would happen, happened. You've got the four general in out of the Seleucid uh, Empire up there in Greece. The eighth king is this guy, Antiochus. That's not his real name. His, probably his name is like George Brown or something. No, it's not. But he gives himself this name, you know. Uh, he calls himself Antiochus, the illustrious one. Uh, I, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, he was an athlete in that day or something. Some of these guys take... Uh, on, on names for themselves. But nonetheless, uh, he takes this name upon himself and he begins to conquer. Now, what he wants to do is he wants to drive southward towards Israel because he wants to take over from the Ptolemies. He wants to take over uh, Egypt I as well. Uh, he is somewhat uh, successful in, in doing that, declares himself to be the, uh, the king of Egypt. He never takes over Alexandria. Uh, and uh, it's kind of a partial victory. He sets up kind of a little bit of a puppet government. Uh, and, then, and then he basically, then with Israel, he kind of comes off as, I really want to help you guys out here. You know, you've been being ruled by the other guys. They're the bad guys. I'm the good guy. Uh, and so I tell you what I'm going to do here. You can keep, uh, you know, worshiping the way you want to and so forth, but you certainly need to be enlightened about the Greek culture. And you need to be a little more open to change and, and so forth. And our way of doing things and our way of thinking. And there was a group of Jewish leaders at that time that said, well, that's not such a bad idea, you know. And it's like, these guys are going to be calling the shots around here and all. And, you know, we don't need to be quite so conservative. We don't need to be quite so hardcore when it comes to following God's word and so forth. We could probably make a little adjustment here in our thinking and, and, uh, and uh, get a little more liberal in the way we would view the scriptures and interpret them and so forth. So they formed a little group to uh, kind of cuddle up to Antiochus, and they are called the Sadducees. These are the same guys, of course, that are around that give the order to crucify Jesus Christ because they had really gone so far away from uh, their, their faith and their belief in, uh, in the scriptures themselves. Antiochus then... He's got a little problem on his hand because what's the next world power that's coming on the scene? The Romans. They're like right next door. And, and they're growing in power. And basically, uh, they don't really like the idea of him marching around the world and uh, taking more property and calling himself the king of this and the, and the king of that. But nonetheless, he marches this time against uh, Egypt uh, once again to try to totally take over. And when he does... He's making a little headway, but then he's met by the Romans who take a few little ships down there, meet them on the shore. There was a little envoy there. This is 168 B.C., a uh, Roman named Gaius Populius uh, Leonus meets with him and, and says that we really don't think you want to go any, any further here in your little conquest of Egypt or anywhere else for that matter. And basically he says, well, okay, I'll take that under consideration. And, and he, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he really did this. The Roman guy then draws a circle in the sand around Antiochus and says, I think you better give me a decision before you leave that circle and tell me that you're not going to march against Egypt any longer and you're going to kind of cool it. And uh, so he decides that, okay, I either go along with him or die when I walk outside the circle. So he said, okay. So as he then... Romans take their little boats, go back to Rome. He then starts up the Mediterranean going through Israel. And he's not in a good mood. Things haven't gone well in Egypt. So as he moves into Israel at that point, he decides in his rage, he'll just kill like 100,000 people in Jerusalem. Pretty much murder everybody in sight in the streets. 
And then he goes into the temple itself and he takes everything. He takes the, uh, all, all the censers, uh, the table of showbread. He takes the menorah. He takes uh, what, um, again, Maccabee says, uh, if, if you read the chapter one of, of the Maccabees, again, this is the family that rises up and, and, and takes control of Israel again. And they write extensively about this guy, Antiochus. They said, and even takes the hidden treasures and so forth. He does exactly what Daniel said he would do. He makes it illegal, basically, to, to practice uh, Judaism at that point. He sets up a, an altar to Zeus right in where the Holy of Holies was in the Jewish temple and sacrifices pigs on it. Uh, and he, he desecrates uh, everything. Uh, any of the women or children that survive are, are taken into captivity. Uh, most of everybody else flees. And... Um, and does horrific things. If he finds any, any, uh, any rabbis or anybody that's got scrolls of scripture, he throws them to the ground. Daniel said he would throw the truth to the ground. He threw them to the ground and burnt them there. Any, anybody that circumcised their children as the required by the law on the eighth day, any babies found circumcised, he would kill the father and hang the babies publicly. This is a very evil man. I could go on and on. He was evil personified like 10 times. He's a radical guy. Antiochus uh, Epiphany. One of the things he does at that point, he mints new coins with his new name on it. Antiochus Theos Epiphanes. God who has made himself manifest. This guy had a little too much of himself. And, uh, and he is empowered, Daniel says, by another, not himself. He's empowered by Satan and all, all that he's doing. But the king that dominated has a limited reign. We see that in verses 13 and 14. Daniel's told that the sanctuary would be cleansed uh, from, uh, in 2,300 days. Now we know that uh, Antiochus dies in 164 B.C., and uh, uh, in terms of when the temple was first desecrated, we know that was in 171. Uh, the last godly high priest that served there was a, a man named o Onias III. And, uh, and when um, Antiochus comes in, he kills him and then puts his own guy in there. So the temple at that point is desecrated. And it's an amazing thing. From that day, if you start counting uh, 2,300 days later, you arrive at December 25th, 165 B.C., uh, when Judas Maccabeus goes in and cleanses the temple, exactly the way Daniel said that it would happen. It's just uh, amazing the, the details that uh, Daniel gives. And of course, <clears throat> the cleansing of that temple is remembered in the Feast of Dedication, or <clears throat> what we refer to as Hanukkah. It's a feast that Jesus observed. We read about that in John, in John chapter 10. And uh, if you're not familiar with, uh, with, with Hanukkah, the, again, what happened is a, a little bit of a miracle here because uh, they go in, you can imagine, the, you know, uh, going to try to physically clean the temple, but they also had to go through a ritual for eight days doing these ceremonies to, before they could begin their sacrifices once again. One of the things that was required to do that is they had to light the menorah. Uh, they only had a one-day supply <coughs> of oil. It would take a week to kind of regroup and, and make enough oil to burn in the menorah so that they could continue. Uh, they could wait a week uh, till they had the oil. They decided, well, let's light the menorah with the one-day supply of oil we've got, and we'll just trust that God will understand. We need to do this so that we could begin the sacrificial system again. Well, the one day supply of oil burned for the whole week. And, uh, and that's why, what they remember when, uh, when they celebrate Hanukkah today. And, uh, and it's a different kind of menorah than the one in the temple. It's actually a menorah that's got, it's got uh, eight candlesticks or places for the oil on it for the eight days of, of Hanukkah or Feast of Dedication. And then it's got one candle that's taller that sits above the others. And that candle is called the Shamash. And that means servant. It's the servant candle that lights the other candles. It's a picture of Jesus Christ, of, of the Messiah. The Messiah, Isaiah said, would be the servant of the people who would bring light into the world. And so every, every Hanukkah, Jewish families around the world, uh, unknowingly, in a sense, are recognizing the servant Messiah who would bring light into uh, the world. It's kind of a fun 
fun thing to do, and uh, if, uh, if you've, uh, especially if you've got smaller kids, tried pulling it off a couple of times, but I think we waited too long. Our kids were too busy. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of tough to get everybody for dinner eight nights in a row, for one thing. You know what I mean? I've always noticed Christmas comes at a bad time of the year. I don't know if you notice that. It's just a kind of a busy time. And, uh, but anyway, we had fun with it a little bit for uh, a few years. But uh, uh, an incredible uh, prophecy here by Daniel. He gives the details of two kingdoms, this one king that will dominate in power. Uh, and then we go back, more details about this future king described by uh, the uh, angel Gabriel in verses 15 to 27. Daniel continues, while I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man. And I heard a man's voice from the, I want to say Uli, but it's really Uli calling. Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. And he came near the place where I was standing. I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand the vision concerns the time of the end. While he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. He said, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation but will not have the same power. In the later part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a stern-faced king, a master of intrigue, Antiochus, will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many. And take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. The vision of the evening and the morning that has been given to you is true, but seal of the vision, for it concerns the distant future. I, Daniel, was exhausted and lay ill for several days. Then I got up, went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. So again, Kind of in conclusion, Daniel describes the, the vision as pertaining to, uh, to the end. And there's a couple of things here because of verse 19 <laughs> that have led Bible commentators, people that write and speak on prophecy to conclude one of, one of two things. Because in verse 9 it says, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. And they look at those two phrases because everything is pretty much just clicking along here, okay? We got the Medo-Persian Empire. They do their thing. Then we got Alexander. He wipes them out. His four generals come up. One of them, you know, is raised up, Antiochus. You know, he persecutes the Jewish people, and then he dies off the scene. You know, he's empowered by somebody else. He dies basically of, of natural causes. He's not attacked and so forth, and we've got all of these details. And then all of a sudden, Gabriel kind of pops in these two phrases uh, about in the later time of wrath, uh, appointed the time of end. And sometimes Bible scholars will look at that and go, the later time of wrath must be the great tribulation, you know, at the end. Uh, and boy, when you read about Antiochus Epiphany, you would say, that guy sounds a lot like the Antichrist. I mean, the stuff that he's going to do, he's going to be friendly at first, the master of intrigue. He's going to allow them to have their daily sacrifices, and then he's going to take it away. And then he's going to set himself up as king. He's going to throw the word of God down. He's going to persecute the Jewish people. I mean, these things that we've already uh, discussed and learned about the Antichrist, it sounds just like it. So when People see verse 19, they've got to assume that suddenly Gabriel's taken a leap into the future and he's talking about the time of wrath, the great tribulation. And a lot of people uh, take that view and it also because he uses the phrase, the appointed time of the end. But actually, uh, in, uh, in studying this uh, a bit and everything, I've kind of come to the conclusion that even though Antiochus is, is a lot like the Antichrist, we'd say he's a foreshadowing or a type, uh, what's really being spoken about here. Uh, is, is just literally the end of his reign and what's going to happen to him and what did happen to him. What did happen to him? Well, it was in a time of wrath. God's wrath was against the Jewish people because of their idolatry. They didn't observe the Sabbaths and, uh, and keep his word and so forth. So 
Israel, the ten kings in the north, remember, were taken into the Assyrian Empire, God's wrath against them. Uh, the southern kingdom of Judah was taken into the Babylonian uh, uh, captivity in which uh, Daniel is part of and he's writing from. That was a time of God's indignation or, or the time of his wrath. Uh, and this is, concerns the appointed time of the end. This is drawing near of this time of these world empires, in particular uh, the Greek uh, empire. Uh, he describes, Gabriel describes, secondly, the details of this future ruler. And uh, we would say that, man, it's very accurate when it comes to uh, Antiochus, uh, a master of intrigue, completely wicked. And yet, verse 25, he will be destroyed not by human power. And that's what happened to Antiochus. He, wasn't, uh, he didn't die uh, in combat. He didn't uh, die as somebody murdered him and so forth. He died of a disease that basically graphically rotted him from the inside out. And there's some pretty graphic uh, uh, secular documents that, <laughs> that talk about it. But it, it happens exactly the way Daniel said. He would take his stand against the prince of princes. And really he did that in declaring himself to be the God who made himself manifest when he mints his coins and tells everybody he's got a, a new title. Thirdly, uh, Gabriel describes a future ruler and, uh, and here I think uh, the similarities are, are amazing between Antiochus and the Antichrist from what we know about him yet future. Both achieve great power by subduing others. Both rise to power by promising false security. Both will be intelligent and persuasive. Both will be controlled by another, that is Satan. Both will be an adversary of Israel. Both will rise up to oppose the prince of princes. Uh, in this case, the Antichrist will rise up to oppose Jesus Christ himself, and both are terminated by divine judgment. When I uh, first came to the Lord, I, um, I just came out of desperation, you know, because my life was such a wreck. And, uh, <clears throat> and so um, all I was really looking for is if the Lord could somehow forgive me and change me and, and make it better, because I had pretty much messed things up. And... Um, and, and in the process of the Lord doing that, to my amazement, and uh, kind of uh, changing me and my desires and so forth, and, and, uh, and uh, getting through a, a drug addiction and, and some of the other junk in my life, uh, there, the, I was just, you know, I kind of went probably through those first couple of years just thankful for God's grace, you know, just couldn't get over it and stuff. And, uh, you know, I never even thought about the idea of of Bible prophecy and, and uh, why I should believe God's word is inspired and, and stuff like that. I just kind of took it all at face value. It says, Holy Bible. I just took that. I believe that and just read. You know, I did, nobody had to really convince me or anything. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, God did a miracle in me. He's there, man. He's, he's alive. He's working and, and everything. But I, I did notice that then at a point in time, Kathy and I, because we had been involved in so many uh, between us, we covered all the isms and all the, and all the groups, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormonism to all the New Age stuff and everything. So we were pretty much convinced that if, one, if anything, we needed to learn the Bible. And um, uh, there was no K-Light radio. There was no CSN. There was a generic Christian station that if you had the money, they'd put you on. And they did. I mean, it was like anybody and everybody. It was kind of a free-for-all. And... Uh, Boy, yeah, just as uh, new Christians, and we really weren't going to church yet because I still thought if I went into a church, it'd probably be like a little lightning storm or something would happen as I tried to get through the threshold, you know, so I wasn't even going there, you know, and, um, uh, but we were listening to uh, Christian radio, and some of these guys, we came to realize, I thought they were really weird, uh, it turns out they were, and then uh, some of the guys uh, uh, we liked, and, uh, and they were like Chuck Smith, and Greg Laurie, and Raul Reese, and Mike McIntosh, and, and they were on there, and then Pastor Bill uh, was still at North Shore Christian Fellowship, Calvary Honolulu didn't exist at that time, and he would broadcast on Friday night his Sunday morning sermon, and with, we liked these guys, because they're just teaching, teaching the Bible, and um, one thing about, uh, about uh, Chuck and everything, he was always talking about Bible prophecy, and this kind of stuff. Man, I was just fascinated. I, it just blew my mind, you know. And I, I became uh, from this, studies like this, and this is my point, I became convinced, obviously, that, that God exists and he exists out, outside of this time-space continuum. That he knows, he knows the beginning from the end. He sees it all at once. He's like the guy in the Goodyear blimp looking at the Rose Parade. There's the beginning. There's the end. You can see the whole thing simultaneously. 
And that's the way God looks at history. Otherwise, how does he deliver this information to Daniel about things that are going to happen 400 years later to such tremendous detail? And I took great assurance uh, in that God exists and his word is inspired. And I just thought, um, don't call me clever, but I just figured if the God of the universe wrote a book, I probably want to take a look. You know, especially if it's telling me how I'm supposed to live my life. I'm a brand new dad. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I'm trying to, how, you, how are you going to be a parent? I'm trying to figure out how to be a, a business guy and run, run my business. And uh, I'm learning it's not an advertising budget. Uh, when things aren't rolling in, I'm supposed to fast and pray. So that's, we just did it. We just, we, whatever the Bible said, we just did it. And it's amazing how God worked. You know, we were just, you know, nobody had to convince us. He'd radically changed our lives. He'd spoken in prophecy. He'd inspired his word. Let's find out what this thing, I just started dedicating a good portion of my time to studying God's word. Does that make sense? That made sense to me at the time. That was 30 years ago. I'm still doing it. I'm still amazed. I'm still finding out stuff I didn't know. I'm only a week ahead of you. I mean, I'm just kind of getting ready for the next week because it's uh, still an amazing thing to me. I'm still amazed by his grace, but I'm also so thankful that his word is inspired. Then, when I'm struggling and I read stuff when Paul says, he will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you in fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. All right. I, I needed that. It wasn't like, man, I hope that happens. You know what I'm saying? If, if this is God's word, it's all true. I don't have to go... I'm not doing too well right now. I'm not sure how he's going to work that out. It's like, I can say, I don't know how he's going to work it out, but I know it's true. It's going to happen in the end. Uh, there's, you know, we, we then have this new reliance upon all the stuff God says in his word. <clears throat> that's, that's to me. We don't want to take it out of context. You know, we don't want to clean things that aren't there. <clears throat> the, the Bible, the New Testament is filled with, you know, just God's comfort, God's promises uh, for us, watching over us. And it's true. <laughs> it's true and it's real. And that was a conclusion I came to from studying prophecy. God is large and in charge. Amen? And, uh, and because of that, we can, we can trust his word.